This has been a, a very interesting week. I'm so glad that uh, while I was away on vacation that uh, Amy Eiler somehow stumbled upon Andy Oak. Well, that's a story for another day. <laughs> and and it's, it's just been fascinating as we learn about the first ladies of, of uh, in our country's history. And he is the first ladies man. And when I first heard of you, I thought you were going, oh, he's the first ladies man. No, no, he's the first <laughs> ladies man. I got it. So we're ready to go. There you go. So, Andy Oak, it has been enjoyable, but who are the last two ladies we are going to learn about today? Well, last and, and, and not even last, but and certainly not least, there's still so much to talk about. And I want to link volume one and volume two and link the first two centuries with the second two centuries of our country. I want to, I want to talk about Ida McKinley, who was the last first lady of the 1800s. And, you know, she was one of these women I talked about that had health issues. She had um, epileptic seizures uh, that would come on at, at any given time. But even with all of this handicap of, of her um, medical issues, she was the right-hand man of her husband. When, when McKinley was governor of Ohio and living in Canton, she would place herself in a chair outside of his office. And, uh, Governor McKinley at the time would walk by with any number of his uh, associates or, or people that he had meetings with. They would greet Mrs. Mrs. McKinley, and they would walk in, and McKinley would shut the door, but not all the way. So Ida McKinley could listen in, and afterwards, the, whoever the meeting was with would say goodbye to Mrs. McKinley, and then he'd say, all right, come on in, honey. Tell me, tell me how the meeting really went. And, you know, the sad thing about the McKinley administration, beyond her physical uh, medical handicaps, were they lost two daughters very, very early, um, died in, as, as children. So it was not a very active White House. It was a very efficient White House. It was a very politically successful White House. I mean, not, not trying to make a joke or, or light of the situation, but McKinley's assassination put a huge damper on the success of his administration and his work, obviously. Um, but, but he was doing great things and, and was very popular. But Mrs. McKinley, despite all of, her, all of her handicaps, she still took the time to sew hundreds of pairs of slippers to be given to war vets and orphans and auctioned off for charity to raise money. These women have been doing philanthropic endeavors long before they were expected to and long before it was cool to do it, and they've just always been giving back and trying to build a better society for all of us. Hmm. And she was the last First Lady of the 1800s, the First Lady of the 1900s. Yeah, the first First Lady of the 20th century is... Edith Roosevelt. And Edith Roosevelt comes in with Vice President Theodore Roosevelt, who takes over for McKinley. And this was such a stark difference from the, the more serious and, and not necessarily dour or, or, or doomsday kind of, uh, but just it was not a lively administration, the McKinleys, the parties, the state dinners and all. It was just very stiff, we'll say. And Roosevelt comes in, and Theodore Roosevelt's a crazy man. And they've got a zoo, and they've got like six kids running around, and, and, and ponies that are riding elevators. There's a, a, a New York Times uh, cartoonist that does a thing at the, at the, at the, uh, uh, the time the Roosevelt's come in. It's Santa Claus with, with a pack full of kid, toys coming down the White House chimney, and he says, there's life in the old house again. And this is what the country felt. The country so excited to have this youthful family in there. But along with that youthful camp family came a concern. It's very hard for these women, not only to be first lady, but to be mothers and raise children in the White House. And Mrs. Roosevelt, Edith Roosevelt, had a big job doing that because she had a lot of young children. So what she did was she was one of the first ladies to really effectively manage the press and the public expectation with her children, and she hired a society photographer, a big name of the time, to take hundreds of pictures of these children. And she would leak them out to the press and sneak them out to magazines, and this way the public sort of got their meat hooks in the kids. They, they, they were part of the president and first lady's family and lives with the access to these photographs, but it was all controlled by Mrs. Roosevelt. Now, beyond that, Mrs. Roosevelt knew that this was a house of business, but also a house for a family. And with such a large family, she worked with a New York architecture firm 
to change the footprint of the White House. She changed it from the uh, Victorian era of, of McKinley and, and previously to a Federalist design that the, the Adams is the first first family to live in the White House after the completion of the White House. They would have recognized it was very it was very classic. It was very it's what it is today. But she changed the footprint by adding the offices. The East Wing and West Wing are because Mrs. Roosevelt insisted on having a separate place for the family to live. So when we're naming Roosevelt, Eleanor is the first Roosevelt that comes to mind. A lot of people don't even know. Theodore Roosevelt's wife's name, and she is the one that changed the physical footprint of the White House that exists today in modern times. Wow. Well, speaking of Eleanor Roosevelt, if you if you don't mind, uh, of course, I I talked to a World War II veteran one time who saw this woman get on a a troop train, and uh, he said he didn't really recognize her. He said she wasn't particularly pretty or anything. And then as she got closer and closer, he realized who it was. And by the time she got there and talked to him, she was the most beautiful woman in the world. He said that she spent ample time with every troop, every soldier, hold their hand, pat them on the back, laugh with them, whatever. She was engaged with every one of them, and he was in love with her by the time he got back there to shake her hand. Jack, I hear so many stories about Eleanor Roosevelt. The two, the two for some reason, the two people, the two first ladies that most people come up to me and know or know about or have stories about are Eleanor Roosevelt and Lady Bird Johnson. <laughs> and a woman came up to me at a speech in Western Maryland and said that she was on a junior high school trip to the new UN, to New York, big school trip. And she got separated from the class, which I can identify with because I was a bit of a wanderer, still am to this day. But she got separated from the class looking for the restroom, came around the corner and bumped into Eleanor Roosevelt, who would have been there as, a, as one of the chairman of, of a human rights organization and, and, and committee for the, for the UN at the time, probably appointed by um, uh, Truman or, or, or JFK, I forget the year. In any event, she said that she could not have been nicer and walked her around the whole building until they found their class. So she got her own little private tour from Eleanor Roosevelt. I mean, she, she, was, she was her husband's eyes, ears, and legs. Uh, FDR was, uh, was in a wheelchair because of the polio, and Eleanor Roosevelt would go out in the field and do the recon work for her husband. She, she did the radio address that, that, that told the country and the world that the Pearl Harbor uh, attack had come. So um, a highly, highly influential and, and beloved First Lady, Eleanor. Uh, I never realized until these conversations with you the kind of influence and, maybe for want of a better word, power that the First Ladies held not only over their husbands, but the importance they held in the country. I, and... Uh, I, I wonder, if I may, if we end up having first gentlemen, that is, husbands of women who are president, I wonder if first gentlemen, as the decades go by, will have been shown to wield the same kind of influence and power over their presidential wives as you have illustrated with the first ladies. Well, Jack, that's an excellent point, and I'm sure it'll happen sooner than later. I mean, we had we had two chances for that in this last election cycle. If Carly Fiorina had done better and her husband Frank had been the first first gentleman, that's where we would have gotten the first sense of what a true first gentleman would do or, or how he would act or what, what duties he would perform. And the reason I say that is because the other option would have been Bill Clinton as the first first gentleman. But keep in mind, Bill Clinton, his title will be president forever. Oh, yeah. That's he right. is always a president. He is always President Clinton. So in that administration, and I write about this in volume two, very, very in-depthly, very, very clearly based on my studies and my travels and research. But I think because Hillary is, is we know her to be a very intelligent and highly educated woman. We also know that when she was Secretary of State and Senator Clinton, we never saw her and her husband together. And that's because there would be a power struggle. There would be, there would be, he always has that past president title and position and knowledge and influence, and he's no shrinking violet. So I think Bill Clinton could have quite possibly been the first president 
to become a secretary of state. Um, if, yeah. if, 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 if they were to use, if the Clinton administration were to use President Bill Clinton, first gentleman Clinton, in his strong elements, they would have put him out on the international stage where he has huge success, huge appeal, and, and very effective. So he would have either been a de facto secretary of state or, or an official secretary of state or something in that capacity. And then who does that lead to be the hostess for uh, yeah. Hillary Clinton's White House? Uh-huh. Well, Chelsea. Oh, so then we've got it back where Chelsea's hosting parties and Chelsea's taking people around, you know, the spouses of world leaders that, that, that you know, I mean, Bill Clinton is a former president and, and you're not going to take that away from him, and nor should you. So his power and influence would continue in his wife's administration. But it's going to be very, very interesting to see what first gentlemen do do in the White House. Uh, but they will be true partners, just like the wives are to, to their husbands now, for sure. How easy it is, is it for the First Lady's men to really study and understand a First Lady while she is in, in that office? I know that now you um, are covering a bit of Melania and, and before that, Michelle Obama. Um, is it easier when they're done with their tenure to understand their influence? It it is. I mean, you know, it's 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 you kind of got to let it all settle in until you realize how history is going to portray them and what their legacy is going to be. But the other thing is, these modern first ladies and presidents don't have the museums and stuff yet. I mean, when I was doing the project, the the Bush forty three museum had just opened in Dallas, so Michelle Obama and President Obama don't have their museum yet and won't have it till twenty twenty, and the Trumps even further beyond that. So that's where you go and you get the artifacts and you find out. I mean, you know, I said at the very beginning of this week, what we know about these first ladies are basically their time in the White House and as it relates to their husbands. But to find out about the woman, the young woman, the girl, the, the elementary school student, you know, growing up, how she lived, how she was raised, how she was educated and things like that, you really have to wait until history sets that mark and, and has that facility where you can go and explore those artifacts, those documents, and those letters. But, you know, information, we're, we're kind of, you know, over-informed as a society now. So you do get a glimpse into their current work better than you would with, with a historical person because you're here. You see it. You live it. You read it. You see them on TV. Obviously, with technology, you know, Michelle Obama and Melania Trump are the first two first ladies to have the the uh, ability and advantage of social media, mm-hmm. uh, you it know, may- with, with, with Facebook and Twitter and all these things where they can put out this information in these articles. And the news cycle just gets so much faster and faster with, with each day, it seems, that we do get more information currently about them. But looking at their past lives, you really have to wait and see how they're, how they're immortalized in, in, in history and represented. Well, I sure learned a lot talking to you, and now I'm fascinated even more. And I didn't even realize until hearing these conversations or being a part of them about how influential they have been in my life. You know, Lady Bird Johnson and selling her shrubs, trees, and bushes across America. Beautification of America. You're absolutely right. And, And Jackie Kennedy remodeling the White House and showing us around on TV. You know, that was a that was a big deal. There's a lot of first lady images in my mind that I guess I just never realized were as significant as they indeed For are. For sure. And Jack, think of this, you know, what we all we all watch that television special, we all have that image or have seen it on YouTube of the Jacqueline Kennedy, but the first lady who collected more historical artifacts for the White House than any other first lady is not Jacqueline Kennedy. It's Pat Nixon. And Very few people know that because Pat did it very quietly. But also, you know, Jacqueline started that, got the ball rolling, but her administration obviously cut short. And other people that decided to or wanted to picked up the ball and ran with it where she left off. But very few people know that Pat Nixon collected more historical artifacts than any other first lady in history. I guess I'm going to have to read up on her. I was so mad at her husband during that time. I guess I didn't pay too much attention to her. So <laughs> I'll look her up in your series. <laughs> Please do. Yeah, look, look. You'll you'll get a you'll get a kick out of out of the Pat Nixon chapter and 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 look at her in a new light. I assure you, as as I think it will be the case with with most, if not all, of these women.
Mr. Andrew Oak is the first ladies' man. He has two books, Unusual for Their Time, On the Road with America's First Ladies, Volume 1 and Volume 2. You can find them at firstladiesman.com, and there's a link at kfgo.com on the podcasts that we've had with him this week. It's been, they've been great conversations. Thank you so much, Andy, for spending time with us. And uh, for anyone who missed a minute of them, they can all be found at kfgo.com and firstladiesman.com. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much. We'll see you all again sometime soon, I hope.